Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. It's exciting news out there. Boar's Head Processing Plant in Jared, Virginia, sorry to say, has closed. You know what it was? It was that, that liverwurst. Now, for those of you who don't know, liverwurst is a sausage made out of liver and other things that shall go nameless. And here is an example of how a sandwich that you might make out of listeria. Oh, I mean uh, liverwurst. Anyway, they're not making liverwurst anymore. Now, it didn't prevent my assistant from getting me a sandwich with boar's head meats, by the way, which I assume she's trying to kill me. But anyway, I, it, no offense to boar's head. I'm sure they've got it under control. So today we're talking a lot about avian flu because it's getting out of control. And I think it's time we start being, actually kind of start worrying about it more seriously. H5N1 is avian flu. It was first identified in wild geese in 1996. It's been circulating around ever since. Uh, but in 2023, it made a big change and acquired some genetic mutations that allowed it to suddenly infect uh, sea mammals. I, I, you'll recall a couple years ago, we talked about the sea lions and elephant seals that had died in Argentina and off the U.S. coast, all with H5N1. And what's a concern is, okay, <laughs> sea lions, they're out there at sea, but cows are here with us. And so the fact that it's been so extensive in cattle, in dairy cattle, and also in the poultry industry makes it a very concerning that something, you know, might happen and jump to humans. Well, the, the latest state to join the fun is California. It's now the 14th state to report bird flu in dairy cows. You, I did not know this, but California is the number one milk producer in the United States. And last week, uh, samples from three dairy cattle farms tested positive. So that's now the 14th state that has it. Uh, I also didn't know that there's a, over $800 million in a USDA uh, pilot project to actually test for bird flu in, in uh, dairy cattle. And, but there are only 41 herds in 13 states that are being regularly monitored, uh, including the one in California. Uh, Colorado has recorded the most of infected herds but it doesn't mandate that every farm uh, actually test. And so the concern is that as long as it's a voluntary program, not every, every cattle herd is being tested. So it's probably more extensive than we know. And also, you know, I don't think we're testing enough of the, the people who are taken care of in the poultry industry and, as well as dairy, uh, dairy farmers. So uh, where do we stand in the animal world with H5N1? 10,000 wild birds have been positive, 100, 000, 100 million poultry have been, uh, have been affected, 202 dairy herds. Uh, so it is pretty, pretty extensive in poultry and in the dairy uh, industry. So far in humans, there have only been 15 cases in, since 2022. Four cases followed exposure to dairy cattle this year. Nine cases have been associated with poultry industry in this year. One was in 2022. And states that have reported cases have been Colorado, Michigan, and Texas. The big concern was this one case that I talked about last week that was a woman from Missouri who has no known animal exposure. So this is a, a really important case to think about because does this represent a jump to humans? This was identified through the state, uh, Missouri State Surveillance Program. A woman was admitted to the hospital with, uh, with, flu, with uh, pneumonia. They tested her for influenza and sent the sample to the CDC and it came back uh, as H5N1. The concern was she has no known animal exposure, no close contacts uh, who are in at-risk jobs. There was not a cattle uh, farm that had been positive in Missouri. Uh, so it's a big concern. There have been poultry outbreaks in Missouri, so it's, it's there in the state, uh, but it's a big concern. Uh, there have also been H5N1 uh, I detected in wild birds in Missouri. So it leaves kind of four questions in mind. You know, what's being done to investigate the situation? Uh, the concern, obviously, uh, is that uh, that the U.S. hasn't been as proactive as it could be. There's, you know, testing some herds, not everyone. There's not as extensive uh, uh, testing in humans that we could be doing. And if the virus is being 
adapting to mammals, it's a very concern that could easily jump to humans. Uh, what is the you know, uh, extent of the spread in cattle? Right now, there's over 200 herds in 14 states that we know of. As I mentioned before, not every, state, not every cattle farm is required to test, and so there may be many more. Uh, we know so far that the virus that is in cattle is a type is is from a particular clade and genotype that we know of. So we know that particular virus H5N1. We know this very specifics about it, and so we need to test all the human cases to make sure that is the exact same one that's in cattle. Uh, also, the concern with this particular case is, you know, is there some other exposure? <laughs> Does she have cats? Uh, we know that cats uh, occasionally uh, can get it from unpasteurized milk, which she exposed to unpasteurized milk. Does she have bird feeders, which she exposed to wild birds? All this needs to be investigated, and we really don't know. And, you know, the other thing is we know that consuming raw milk is also a problem, so maybe, maybe it was that, but we really don't know. But when you sort of step back on it, like, you know, what is the exposure in the United States? Well, if you remember the Wuhan wet markets we talked about with COVID? Look at that. That's pretty impressive. Looks like a wet market. That's actually from Queens, New York, New York City. So the problem is that there are many, many live poultry markets all across the country, but very much in New York. Uh, this one in, in particular is close to schools and residential areas. Many of these markets sell uh, live chickens, ducks, and quail, all of which can get uh, H5N1. And they're also around slaughterhouses that have large animals, cows, pigs, etc. This is another live poultry in New York City, close quarters of a number of chickens. You know, so we know now, so far in the state of New York, there's actually been a lot of H5N1 detected in commercial flocks as well as backyard flocks in ne nearly 19 million birds uh, in the United States. So. In New, York City, in New York State alone, there have been 27 flocks with avian flu, affecting 26,000 birds. So if you start thinking about the scope of the problem, it's, it's getting to be pretty large. Uh, we know that you know, they're in the Northeast alone, there are over 25 million birds are sold live in markets. Uh, we don't appear to be any better than any other country in terms of the way we handle animals that are living. Uh, so it's not like we're safer than what was going on in Wuhan. Uh, you know, many of these markets have already experienced H5N1, and the way the state inspectors come in is they make them close down, sterilize for five days, and reopen. So we're not really doing that great a job. Uh, and that's the concern. There's a lot of virus out there. Uh, it's beginning to jump into mammals. We have plenty of opportunities to be exposed. So is there any good news? Well, there is really one really great piece of, of data that came out this past week from our own Baylor College of Medicine and Tony Moresso's group. As you know, we've talked about probably the best thing that came out of COVID was the, the discovery by this group here at Baylor that, you know, wastewater analysis is probably the best way to follow emerging pathogens in current pandemics. Well, they had a paper in the New England Journal. Uh, lead author was Michael Tissa and uh, in Tony Moresso's group with a bunch of other authors. And basically what they found is in Texas, they found the avian flu in the wastewater. This is the first uh, discovery of being able to do this methodologically in wastewater. Uh, it allows us to monitor viral levels uh, and also the evolution of the virus. We can determine in real time what's happening with uh, H5N1. Uh, we can tell whether or not really it's circulating just in cattle, birds, cats, or milk, or human cases. And this is the way the CDC ought to be following. This should be nationally followed the way uh, th uh, we are doing it in Texas and the way Tony Moreso's group is doing it. Uh, they will also, you know, we can do widespread sequencing to look to see whether or not the, the virus uh, is actually evolving. And one of the reports this past week out of Texas is we're reaching newer, the highest levels ever. So clearly there's a ton of H5N1 around. There was a paper in The Economist saying, well, what happens if we have another pandemic? You know, the pandemic is likely to be H5N1. It, you know, it just based on the amount of, of infection of cattle and poultry, it's almost, uh, it almost seems unlikely that we won't have it jump into humans. Uh, the other thing that could happen is as seasonal flu arrives, 
if a person is infected with flu and uh, gets exposed to, uh, let's say, the bovine version, uh, flu is very good at doing what's considered, uh, they do sort of exchange various parts of the genome uh, in either cassette form or mutation forms, and so it could very easily adapt to humans. And, and one of the biggest concern is, you know, where there are cattle, there's often pigs on the farm. Pigs are known to harbor viruses, remember the swine flu epidemic, very easily jump to humans. And so what, it could be cow to pig to human, but we're very concerned that it could jump. So the question the economist wrote was, how deadly would a pandemic be? Would it be as bad as COVID? Well, if you look back so far, since this particular virus emerged, there have been nine human, 900 human infections. About half have been fatal. Almost certainly it's not that high a mortality because we know other people have probably been infected and were uh, maybe asymptomatic. So it's, the fatality seems high, but the difference between COVID and, and H5N1 is we've been exposed to flu every year. And so everybody in this country who's older than the age of two has been, has been exposed to flu. And, and we have some innate immunity. In other words, we have some recognition to other flu viruses. And so it's very unlikely it would be as bad as COVID, uh, but it is likely it would be like, uh, it would spread very quickly just as flu does. So the other difference is, uh, I think for us, we have drugs that are very useful against flu, Tamiflu, for example. There's every reason to believe those drugs would be uh, equally effective or almost as effective uh, against H5N1. In addition, we have vaccines that are already developed. Uh, the mRNA vaccines we know can be brought in to bear very quickly. And of course, we always have Peter Hotez who can make an old traditional vaccine. Uh, so I think that, you know, it would be a big problem, uh, and it will be when it finally happens. Uh, it will require billions of, of vaccines, and probably the biggest threat is the problem we have with people thinking vaccines aren't effective. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of work going on broadly neutralizing antibodies. There's a, there's a couple of studies um, by uh, Bart Haynes, group, former Baylor grad at Duke, who are trying to develop a broadly neutralizing uh, vaccine, which would be great. So anyway, right now, the kind of the highest threat is uh, as we enter the flu season is a concern for H5N1 spilling out and becoming a pandemic. Uh, I'm, because I spent so much time on that, I'm not going to spend that much time on COVID this week. I'll catch you up. More. Really, nothing has changed with COVID. The same uh, variant is still dominant. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. And influenza season, the only thing I want to say right now is influenza season hasn't really started. If you look at where influenza is, hasn't quite begun, although we anticipate that it will. So in, because of that, uh, I would begin, I would definitely get uh, your COVID vaccine now, and I would start getting uh, my flu vaccine. I've, of course, I've already had both. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, a big shout out to all our research postdoctoral associates and fellows. This is Postdoc Appreciation Week. They're really, you know, advancing their careers. We couldn't, the labs couldn't function without them, and we love them. And this is a, an appreciation week for them. Uh, most of the research done in, in our labs is done by graduate students and postdocs. So we really, really uh, respect what they do, and we're very much uh, involved with their training and their f future careers. So congratulations to all the postdocs here at Baylor College of Medicine and everywhere in the country. Also, I want to congratulate Dr. Sha Zhang Zhou, who has been named a new McNair uh, Scholar. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine here, and his research focuses on obesity and diabetes, and the, specifically the role of neuromodulation in regu regulating metabolism and diabetes. Uh, this is really important. As you know, diabetes continues to grow as a problem in the United States. So uh, uh, any thing we can do to address that uh, increasing health issue is really important. And then finally, Sunday marks the first day of fall. It may not feel like that in Texas. It's 150 degrees today or something like that. It feels like that. I love it when they say it's 98, but it feels like 190. I never could I understand that. But anyway, uh, it is time to get your flu shot and your COVID vaccine. So uh, it's great to rec We can't wait. Here in Texas, we can't wait until the fall arrives because we think it'll begin to finally cool off. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>